Hello, hello, hello. Today I'm talking with Stefan Wolpers. We talked about what he sees as his job as a change agent and also about the advantages of reinventing the wheel. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hello, hello everyone, and hello, welcome with me, Stefan. Um, and when I'm say here, oh, welcome here, I would want to show us a little bit where we are, and I'm in Belgium, and this is Ghent, Belgium, and um, Stefan, if I'm correct, you're somewhere uh, in, in Germany, in Berlin. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we're moving in. And I know that uh, some, some time ago, I interviewed J. Allen Morris, who's uh, also living in, in Berlin. So there's uh, already two. From diversity point of view, we have two people more or less in the same. Well, Berlin is a big city, so it's probably not uh, very close. Uh, but anyway, um, so and let's uh, bring you back on screen. Um, let's see if I can hide this again. Let's bring you back on screen. And here, um, also time zone wise, for me, it's uh, eight minutes after six. And what's the time on your side? Uh, it's the same. We are both in it's the CET. Same. Yeah. We're in, uh, well, that's the, it's lots of miles away, but, uh, well, not that much, but still we're in Europe and all in the same time zone. It's a little yep. bit how we roll. And we, I kind of jumped into that, but Stefan, for the few people that don't know you, could you in, give a small introduction? Who are you? Of course. Uh, first, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for, for, for having me in the first place. I'm um, really grateful for that because uh, there's a lot of things I like to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, well, who am I? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm working as a professional scrum trainer, so I educate people in how to practice Scrum or when not to practice Scrum and what to think about, um, mm -hmm. how to handle with, uh, handle uncertainty and uh, complexity and you know, how to, to deal with that in a sustainable way without killing themselves. Hmm. That's an interesting uh, next, uh, last addition to it, I would say, <laughs> because indeed sometimes teamwork and making sure that we uh, collaborate together means sometimes we have to say the hard things, but in a way that we're still getting along. <laughs> and and that's, that's an important message to bring in that. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, just because we're in an agile environment doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, all all rainbows and unicorns, you know, so it's uh, life is a negotiation, life uh, is conflict, and that's not different from from any agile environment. Uh, we just need to, to deal with it in an appropriate manner. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. And I really like how you you adapt uh, at this to that because that's indeed uh, sometimes uh, when you go to agile conferences, it might look like all a lot of kumbaya kind of thing. Oh, mm -hmm. we're all no, it's it's not not uh, well. It's not always easy, but partially because we're not walking away from the difficult uh, conversations, I would say. Uh, but still important to still do it in in a, in, a, in a way that we still can have that these kind of conversations. Hopefully okay, for uh, let's uh, jump into that uh, very first question. What is something that uh, people usually don't know about you, but, but has influenced you in, in who you are? I hate being told what and how to do things. Uh, I really can't stand it. You know, this is, this is uh, unbearable. And uh, I'm, I'm not a good employee from that perspective. So <laughs> most of my time I've been self-employed uh, because it, it simply does not work. You know, so you have to earn my respect um beyond the level that uh, courtesy brings right and um it's uh, it's a mixed mixed uh, bag so to speak as far as only my respect is concerned when i look back at my life you know, so, um that's so uh, I'm, I'm i'm not really really good at this you know so particularly what i really get mad about is this idea but i pay you you know as if giving me some money is is the the adequate answer to my question to Okay, it's enough that you show me where I need to be. It's fine when you set up some guardrails, but the rest I can figure out on my own. 
you know, get out of my way. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's um, basically <clears throat> one of the driving factors behind what I do. Interesting. And um, uh, well, I want to jump a little bit. You said you're a Scrum trainer, and in a sense, mm -hmm. Scrum also tells you has some some kind of guidelines. And I think there is also some guidelines on how to give the training or some limited but still there is something to need to talk about how is that different than from from that worst client for example that well or some of these bad clients that try to tell you what to do how is that different for you i have some ideas but i would like to hear yeah them. well uh, the classic problem always is dogmatism you know it never worked you know so um particularly not in complex environments Dogmatism is the easy way out. You know, it, it, it makes you feel good because you have a have a detailed agenda, what to do and when to do and how to do this, and you cannot fail. And if you create some sort of of uh, uh, mystical environment around it, you, you pretty much feel good. I can I can fully understand this. You know, so people people like to be certain about what they do. You know, people like to be busy. You know, they like to forge their own destiny instead of uh, you know uh, succumbing to to their fate. That uh, world, the world, all life has in, uh, has uh, figured out for you. you know, the problem is life does not work this way. You know, by all means, it, it really does not. Dogmatism is is, is nightmarish and applied to Scrum. Um, the question also is, and um, I started pondering more and more about this is. Um, first of all, we, we don't get paid to practice Scrum. You know, this is, we're, we're getting paid to solve our customers' problems in a sustainable way uh, so that we can contribute to the bottom line of our organization. That, that's, that's the core of, uh, of uh, our professional existence. And the question is, how can Scrum contribute to that? I think Scrum is an excellent, uh, excellent framework for a lot of things, but it's not the panacea for everything. And uh, by all means, uh, it's, it's, it's not a good approach to uh, stick to the Scrum Guide, you know, waving the Scrum Guide in front of the nose of everyone else and then uh, insisting on, okay, this is the right way to do this. There, there is no right way of doing things. Right? Um, there might be a right way in, under the current circumstances in this context based on what we know now, but it might change uh, half an hour later. <laughs> so, um, what I'm really puzzled about is this, this, this inflexibility of many people, you know, so um, that's challenging. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like the fact that you say there is, yeah, the dogmatism is, is yeah, it, like you say, um, it's, well, almost never works. There, there might be places where it worked, but uh, probably in, in most cases not, uh, because that never and always are part of a dogmatism as well i would say uh but i really like what what, what you say that that yeah the, the, the way you deal with it uh certain things work in certain circumstances and i i never thought about the the, the way you phrased it uh, five minutes of half an hour later things might already be different um yeah that is uh, that is really like uh, yeah, an, an important way of, of looking at things. Um, and when when asked the question, what is something people usually don't know? Um, how is how is that? How does that um, come across? Because like yeah, typically when people don't know how 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 are um, clients responding when you're trying to say this is this is not how I work? Or what's their Typical, or what's uh, uh, reactions of people? When oh, you there's, to tell them? there's a whole range of reactions. Some say, "Okay, I can fully understand this. You know, you have my respect for doing this." Um, others are puzzled. You know, <laughs> um, I once fired myself from a cozy job at a large uh, utility uh, because I felt I couldn't nothing more contribute to the whole thing, and they were completely surprised. You know, but why are you leaving? Um, it's uh, I haven't paid the invoices, you know, uh, on um, is something wrong. <laughs> and I just said, guys, um, I think I've come to the end of my engagement here. I, I, I don't see that we're that we're making progress anymore. You know, maybe it's me. And so uh, I rather like to move on and um, offer you the opportunity to change things here around. 
and um, that's that's interesting. You know, <laughs> um, of course, it's uh, uh, I'm privileged in the in the in the in the sense that uh, I'm I'm a bachelor. I don't have to support any kids or dogs or cats or whatnot, and um, I I can afford this. You know, so I have. Um, Okay, I don't need to work here, money, uh, um, so that I can say, okay, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> and um, it's 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 not an expression of it's either my way or the highway. But um, the moment I feel that I cannot contribute to making things better for everyone involved, you know, the moment it feels like it starts to feel like a job. You know, when we're trading my time for money. Um, that is really a moment when I consider, okay, something needs to change. And um, most often uh, it's uh, it's that I have to go somewhere else or be somewhere else. Yeah, I really like what, what you say is that sometimes at some point you're no longer the, the best thing. And, and like you say, sometimes it might be that, um, yeah, maybe you brought your message, it, it doesn't come across or they came across to a certain level and then they they hire someone else and he or she might say the same thing but it comes again across now and and sometimes mm. yeah. it, it's also interesting that clients don't always realize that it's a two-way street that also you as a consultant can say well sorry for whatever reason mm. i don't no longer want to do some clients think that they, they only have the choice they say when a contract stops or starts um and i think it's Partially, or at least that's how it's working for me. The fact that I'm also saying at some point, like, I like to, to do this or I don't like to do this anymore is actually part of what makes me tick and, and help mm -hmm. in multiple ways. It's interesting that, that yeah, some clients have a hard time understanding. That's, uh... Yeah, it's a very uh, an, an industrial paradigm driven perception. You know, we pay you and you work here. You know, so and uh, I don't think this is a is a good model for for the twenty first century. You know, you, you, I mean, you, you, um, you want your workforce not only to comprise uh, mercenaries. You know, you want some people among them who really are in for 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 the real thing. You know, who believe in what you do and who want to change the world. And um, many many people don't understand this. <laughs> You know, I have at least yeah. trouble with it, you know. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean that you don't want to be paid, but at the same time, it's like it's not oh. the only drive. And I oh. assume that, well, I've, I've seen it that I, for myself, at some clients, I said, oh, this is actually so much a job that I want to take. And I, I know that for whatever reason, my typical fee might not work here. And I might have a different kind of fee. Uh, that is lower, uh, just because this is an interesting job. Mm. Uh, that doesn't say anything for future fees, lower or higher. That that's no. a completely different kind of ball game. But it's really like, do I? Uh, what I hear for you is that you say you really value how much change can you bring to that uh, that corporation or that team or whatever that people that are hiring. Is that a correct uh, assumption? Oh, totally. Um, anything below that level would be, from my perspective, unethical. I mean, we're, we're change agents. Our job is to bring change, you know, help people embrace change and uh, um, <clears throat> involve themselves in change, uh, become part of the change. You know, this, this is my job. And if I cannot provide this, um, I, I, I need to move on. You know, if we're, we're not figuring out why on earth I'm failing at providing this. I'm, I'm not really good at ordering stickies, you know, so this is, why would I do that? I mean, I've, I've never met anyone who has no clue how to order office supplies or borrow office supplies from the neighboring team when they have their lunch break. You know, so mm -hmm. they don't need me for that. Mm -hmm. Well, you might at first get it, show them how it can be done, but then very quickly you don't want to mm -hmm. come in. The person the administrative person to do all of that stuff um i've come back and forth in a way that sometimes mm -hmm. i need to show teams a little bit like okay you can it's actually that easy to do that kind of stuff uh, just as an example but indeed uh it, it doesn't help many people if you 
take away if you do some of that stuff where they actually can can do their selves it's a little bit like with children as long as they're small of yeah. course you need to Always. you need to to uh clothe them you need to feed them but if, if they're a certain age then it's like okay you can definitely put on your clothes yourself i'm not going to do that until you leave the house that's that would be insane um so yeah that's um that's indeed part of it okay let's move to that uh, second question if you had not been doing what you've been doing now, do you have any idea what could have become of you? Oh, I started chemistry. Um, so I was uh, running around in white lab coats and uh, changing the world. You know, it was a long time ago. I'm not sure I have uh, any clue how that would work today. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun uh, a long time ago. Uh, and so, and how long did you do that? Uh, I never worked in a laboratory. Um, so. Ah, yeah. So you, you, if I do, I understand correctly. You studied it, but then before you actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, always en ended up in developing hard and software. Uh, I've been doing that for and, my whole life. Hmm? And how did you make the switch from studying something and then doing something more different? Oh, just very, very, very simple. Um, so at the at the time, I mean, nobody can understand this today. But at the time, for example. Um, writing protocols and stuff like that with the, many of these formulas, as you can imagine, you had to draw them by hand. Um, mm -hmm. So the very first programs came up, so ChemDraw and something like that. And um, so I decided uh, at a tremendous personal cost to uh, buy myself a Macintosh um, because uh, we had a, a, a Mac dealer around the corner from, from my faculty. And uh, we could print there on one of the very first laser printers. And now you know how old I am. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, even uh, even if it was highly discounted because university discount, um, I had to work uh, on the side to actually pay for for this thing. And of course, I started doing things so I'm I'm relatively good at, you know, training people how to use these things. <laughs> And so I uh, slowly but steadily moved into this whole thing, you know, by very simple things, organizing trainings and uh, helping people understand and uh, uh, provide the first success they had with uh, with these new technologies. And uh, yeah. And, and you train yourself in that or how did, that, how did that work? Because you decided at some point I'll buy that computer. What mm -hmm. triggered you to, to buy that? Is that because you were, I don't know, you saw something you had a desire to do that how, how did that oh, totally happen? yes um so at the time i, I really suck at programming you know I'm, I'm not good at this you know i'm quite okay with excel uh but uh, 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 html css okay for my blog but anything beyond that you don't want to want me to do that and it was really annoying at the time to 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 write my protocols for my 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 uh, university and it was a lot of time I, I spent on that. And I simply needed to change something. And PostScript was a revelation. It was, wow, uh, this is exactly what you were designing on this on screen. You get printed on a piece of paper. And it was amazing. And I said, OK, this is the way to go. This is this is the future. And uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so it was these little nine nine inch screens, you know, so the classic Macintosh SE, SE30 and stuff like that. Wow. OK, that's yeah. uh, that's a very little, little screen. Yeah, we had one at school. I have no idea how they, they yeah. our teachers got inspired to that. Uh, mm -hmm. But indeed, that was kind of um, kind of the time where, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you could get inspired to do that, but you went even further because at that time I, I think i had friends who were playing around with the computers but not not realizing the potential uh okay i was i don't know i was 13 or 15 when when that was at school so i didn't think about uh, business potential uh it was just cool to to see if we can every time that we could uh have a, i don't know a class where we could do something on a computer that was always fun uh mostly because it was something different than a boring class mm -hmm. uh but but yeah it was it was much more actionable you were doing something the mm. screen was asking you something and and that was interesting but you saw it already at that moment like okay there's stuff to do like you said the the fact that you didn't have to write your formulas anymore that you have the computer yeah, yeah. Sure. stuff that um because yeah. i can imagine at that time 
Uh, even today, I know that if I look at tablets today for uh, understanding handwriting or using uh, tablets or, or I don't know, uh, remarkables to to draw uh, chemical uh, notations, that's really hard. It's still not 100% how how uh, many people would like it to do. But you, at, at, at that moment in PostScript, you saw already some, some, some things there. That's, uh, Saves a lot of time. Yes. And, uh, time is our most precious resource, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, and well, yeah, indeed, like when you try and you retry, then you can learn a lot of mistakes. Okay, let's move to that third question. What do you consider uh, your biggest challenge and or that at this moment, or at least the challenge you want to talk about open on the internet? And, and why is that a good thing for you? Um, I have the tendency to reinvent the wheel. Mm. Um, so it would be so easy to just do some research and then uh, come up with a good understanding of a topic, but I always start from scratch. And I, I teach it myself. Um, so one of my professors at, uh, at the university always mentioned, uh, well, this, if you would only start uh, reading from time to time, li your life would be so much easier. <laughs> and uh, I've uh, never managed to overcome this. So on the one side, it's uh, tremendously um, exhausting because you actually re redo a lot of s s work, right? Um, and you make a lot of mistakes. And uh, even worse, you made mistakes other people already made. You know? uh, on the other side, once I go through such a phase and I, I learn something new, I'm really in it. <laughs> so, um, and then I can move on. So that's... Uh, that's uh, that's a flaw in my design that um, I've been struggling with for decades. <laughs> and um, I guess I will continue doing so. Yeah, I find it interesting because indeed many people say always like, we should not reinvent the wheel. But at the same time, I think the wheel has been reinvented itself for, for many different yeah. uh, years. Uh, if you compare the wheel that was there in, in the Stone Age and the wheel that we're using today in um how would i say it in um yeah in formula one or something like that that's definitely not uh, not the same kind of wheel uh, and i'm trying to bring a picture on screen let, uh, let me see if i can bring it on uh where is it here um this is this is a nice example mm -hmm. of thing reinventing the wheel uh, yes, it has been reinvented, and it brings a lot of brings a lot of value sometimes to do it. Uh, so it, it's an interesting thing that many people think uh, uh, use that phrase as something. This is a bad thing. Well, yes, in some ways we don't always have to reinvent stuff, uh, but there is still progress in in how things were were moving in a way. Mm. Um, and so what I'm hearing for you is that. Uh, what I think I'm hearing is that for you, it's hard to find that balance. At what level am I going too deep into the rabbit hole of mm. trying to do something which has been done before by other people, uh, maybe even smarter people than you are, uh, mm -hmm. and, and doing it, and at the same time saying, well, sometimes just trying to understand it and reinventing something helps me to learn something at that level. Is, is that the correct way that what I'm hearing? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, balancing two things is really problematic. And could you could you give an example of where, uh, because I think it's for many people might be interesting to learn because typically we hear a lot, yeah, not reinventing the wheel, that, that part, mm. the negative part we already know, but could you give me an example of where it was positive to spend that time and energy? Is there is an example that you can have that you have? Um, I wrote my book without giving much thought to it. <laughs> well, to me, it was like an extended ebook, so to speak, and I completely underestimated the effort. And uh, it took me a while to create a system that would work with. Uh, my way of creating content, um, the way that the content then was edited with my editor and uh, then the other editors that uh, on top were working with me. And it, 
it, it really took some time. But in the end, I think I reinvented a writing system. I don't know how many, 100,000 writing systems already exist, but I, find, I found a way that was working for me. You know, so and, um, that was actually a good thing. So, I mean, if you start writing a book, the first thing that you come to your mind is, are you, you Scrivener? And I said, mm, no, <laughs> actually, you like Word. You know, so, and so we did it all in Word. So, and then it worked. And so, that, that was a good, good way of actually doing and uh, reinventing the wheel in, in, in this case. Mm-hmm. I think, well, well, I really love the example of, of writing because um, I, I think everyone who's writing a book, we keep having to indeed think about what works for us, how we do it. Uh, it's not something we, we learned how to write in school, but that's technically writing. We did learn something about spelling and languages and whatever, but really creating a project from start to finish with mm. full ideas and I think these days children are even less learned. I don't know how it is in Germany, but in Belgium, definitely yeah. there is much more books where you have to fill in stuff and you don't even have to write essays or hardly have to write essays. Uh, some of the, I think my children, the first time that they have to write some of these things with larger pieces of paper, multiple pages, I mean, I think it's near university or at university because that's. Mm-hmm. Or we don't we don't spend much time on, on some of these things. That's mm-hmm. um, um, and then you are there as a creator trying to s- create some some knowledge, spread some knowledge, um, where thousands of people have done it before you, and somehow we all have to figure out how it works for us because what is working for someone else might mm. work for you. Um, that's that's really interesting to, to see how things are, are moving there. That's, uh, that's yeah, I, I, I recognize so much in, in what you say, and I've heard it from many, many authors that, uh, and, and yeah, somehow, and it's a little bit like, like with children, and other people will tell you, this is how you raise children, this is how you write a book, well, yeah, this worked for you, but maybe it doesn't work mm-hmm. for me. Um, and and somehow, yeah, we need to figure it out all on our own. It's a very nice example. Um, and it, yeah, sometimes I've had people that that tell me I, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to, to to name people here, but I've had few people that told me it took me like two three books before I actually found a system that was really good and repeatable for now. Yeah. Is the first two three books that were all written in a different way or with a different partner yeah. or a different editor and i needed different kind of things so. I, I fully understand this um. it's uh, and i think well you have um you you publish some things on youtube as well i can imagine that also for you creating things in if it's not just a book but the, the everything you the videos you make it's also it takes a while before you find a way to, to do all of that, or at least that's how it was for me. Is that similar for you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, for the for the uh, ease of, of doing something, I, I, I like Zoom, for example. Um, as far as recording is concerned, Zoom is really not the best thing, right? Um, so I'm slowly but steadily switching to Ecamm, which is offering significantly more opportunities. So virtual cameras and stuff, I can draw things and um, completely different beast, uh, but also significantly more complex. <laughs> and it's a bit of, hmm, <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> uh, let's see how this is working. <laughs> so. Uh. We'll find out. Yeah, I've, I've been similar kind of part. This is where the tool that we're using, well, it used to be called Melon. Now it's called Talk Studio or it's a Streamlab, sorry. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I'm using it is because it actually offers a lot less features and I don't have to worry too much. The disadvantage is, uh, yeah, I, I don't get much different kind of things afterwards. So I, ha- I am limited in how I can edit afterwards. Mm. Uh, as in, I don't have different audio tracks, I don't have different uh, video tracks and stuff like that. But at the same time, it allows me to do it uh, without um, too much other stuff afterwards, um, which, yeah, yeah, because of the, the complexity that 
Ecamm and similar kind of products where yeah. I've also uh, experimented with my things. So Always a question, what's a return on investment? You know, it doesn't make exactly. sense. If, if I delve um, into this thing for two or three weeks, um, what what is, uh, or where, where's the beef, so to speak? <laughs> um, what does everyone have from, from me doing this thing? And very often yeah. you say, or you should say, <laughs> um, it's not worth the effort. Exactly. And that's always a little bit going back and forth, trying something, seeing, okay, that brings more value, but it, what is it? And so the whole thing. So that's very interesting to see that. Okay, let's move to that uh, next question. Um, your, I think everybody who follows you on LinkedIn or other kind of social media knows that you're a very passionate person very have yeah various opinions and really engage in in lots of conversation do you have any idea where that passion where that drive is coming from um do you do you recall this old uh, xk uh, cd uh, graphic uh, someone's wrong on the on the internet <laughs> so are you are you are you coming for dinner no someone is wrong on the internet i have to fix this um <laughs> Uh, I, f I find it interesting. Um, and I still believe that LinkedIn is a rather civilized corner of the of the online world. You know, so no, no flame wars or stuff like that. It's not Reddit or Twitter or whatever. So that's, that's fine with me. And um, there are some, some things that actually needed to be said. Uh, so, I mean... Just to give you an example, these, these, th th there was recently this posting on Reddit where someone was uh, um, got a summer internship as a uh, internship as a junior agile coach, and I thought to myself, "Oh my goodness, you know, um, a I feel sorry for the poor kid, and b I'm I'm mad about the organization. How how can you play with a human being in that way? You know, and uh, so." I, I need to talk about this. This is important to me. <laughs> um, this, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about your feed, uh, but uh, there's uh, a lot of, of agile bashing going on, and um, you know, Scrum, Scrum is dogmatic and stupid, and uh, safe is evil, uh, and whatnot. And uh, I don't think it you you can say that in a, in this simple simple manner. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. so what what you what I'm hearing is that you kind of driven also by okay educating the world on 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 things that you've seen that are making things that could make the world better is is that a good interpretation of, of uh, what you're saying or is there more there? Uh, I would like to say help help people understand that there might be different perspectives on the same problem. Uh, uh, that they have, you know, that there might be other solutions, uh, there might be another background, et cetera, PP. So, for example, um, when I was, was writing these, these, uh, about these anti-patterns, um, I started to think about, okay, what might be the reason the anti-patterns actually are there? Why, why do they exist? And uh, when you start uh, digging into this, actually, some of the anti-patterns are no longer that much of an anti-pattern because there are quite a lot of good explanations why this might be happening. And I thought to myself, hmm, so maybe if we just, uh, in this righteous manner of, okay, we know how Scrum and Agile works and you're not doing it correctly, maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe we should rather focus on figuring out, okay, why are the things the way they are? Because there's always a reason why things are the way they are. Uh, it's, it's not falling from the sky. You know, so there's always a reason why these uh, practices have uh, developed. And there are numerous uh, factors that play into this whole equation. You know, personal uh, agendas, um, uh, personal dislikes, um, politics in the organization, the culture, you name it. You know, uh, so just being quick to judge, uh, I believe, is... Uh, is problematic, you know, and a lot of our problems uh, derive from being quick to judge. You know, you, 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 
Okay, so uh, if we we be talking Kahneman systems here, I know Kahneman system one is is, is really fun. You know, you um, low energy <laughs> expenditure. You know, and uh, you feel good because hey, you solved the problem, you came to a conclusion, and now life moves on. You know, but uh, there's often so much more to it, and um, I would like to learn more about what else is out there. You know, what might be different. What is I really like that, that, uh, yeah, and I really like that you bring in yeah system one and system two. We talked, I think I talked with uh, mm -hmm. Linda Rising here uh, on on that as well. How much that influences us, um, and of course sometimes on the internet we're so much more into the immediate reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, but th I, th I, that's indeed how how I like some of your and and similar kind of reactions from other people that say, well, wait a minute, there is there's actually more. I, I the, the the first gut reaction feels this, but know that, okay, why is there an anti-pattern? An anti-pattern is typically because it 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 feels better for someone maybe to without understanding and going too fast, but maybe because it brought some value at some point and people need to think about, okay, is it still why are we doing it and maybe it's because of historical reasons and then it's good to, to change it because we're all humans we're yeah beasts of habits so if something mm -hmm. works for 10 years we keep doing it maybe if 30 years later it's no longer valuable but mm -hmm. yeah, you know what i've always done it like that and i'm not going to think about it uh, even though it might be blocking me for for other kind of things so that's uh, that is indeed um an important one to, to think about that so, so thanks for for sharing that because i think it's it's really it is important it, it i for me it kind of shows shows a little bit what i well knowing you a little bit it's not like that we hang out a lot but still we we've run into each other online typically on linkedin and yeah this is what i like about some of your interactions and that make me think if i would agree or disagree with you it's you always make me think uh, harder and i think that is what we need so much more in this community to actually with respect make people think about hey why are we doing this why why does it bring value in all kind of direction because sometimes you yeah it might be something good but is it still good and, and mm -hmm. something bad and if it's really bad what kind of value brings it why does it bring any value uh, and it's. I think it, I really like the fact that you link it back to uh, system one and system two reactions because indeed uh, social media we might be much more on the the, the first reaction mm -hmm. and we need to think a little bit more deeper on on what are our options there. Thanks. Yeah, I, I try to sneak in Kahneman too, you know, <laughs> so that people don't understand it in the first place, but uh, actually follow it, you know. So it's also the reason why I like to to run these polls, you know. Um, it's not that I like to learn about how people answer. Of course, I'm interested in that too, but most of the time, my 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 intent is to actually help create a create a moment uh, where people can start reflecting on some things it's probably yeah. something they they took for granted or uh, this is solved you know we do we, we don't have to touch it but maybe there are some other perspectives you now let's have a discussion here you know what it's all about yeah and um, you're completely right i would love to have more people reading fast and learning and thinking fast and slow uh, i think many or the the the, the, the new book uh, I think many people can learn about how our brains are working and how we think. Uh, that would definitely bring much more value, not just in the agile world, but in so much more. Um, also in in uh, yeah in in education to to just name one thing, uh, but so many other kind of things people would learn so much. So thanks for bringing Kahneman in because I think it's it's well for the people that don't know that look at the book. I find it, especially thinking fast and slow, is a very hard book to read. I found mm -hmm. it very. Yes. It's not something that you would no. read on on a beach in in, no. in half an hour. <laughs> now. You, need, you need to really think. Uh, it's yeah. for me an ideal book to use in a book club where you can actually have mm -hmm. discussions and to try to understand. And I I I, I think I've read it two or three times in a book club yes. and every time I learned more from it. Yes. Even even if I think, oh, I'll just organize another book club with that book, 
and when other people will learn no no i'm learning as well because yes. this is yes. this is the kind of thing and maybe it could be something i forgot but usually it's because hey now we're going to another level a deeper level or maybe in another mm -hmm. direction because this is another reading group so it's uh, it's really a very important book to, to talk about and think. Okay, let's move to that next question. What do you consider your your biggest achievement so far? Because I, of course, you will personally uh, the book. Um, seriously, I totally underestimated the effort. Um, I was. Uh, uh, if I had known <laughs> in advance what kind of work this is, I uh, probably would have uh, thought twice about whether to sign the contract or not. But um, it was a was a really good way of um, revisiting a lot of ideas that I had and uh, certainties and truth. Uh, I, I thought that were set and, uh, you know, uh, established and then to just figure out okay maybe it's not the case <laughs> um maybe there's always a different perspective uh, maybe you should just be open-minded you know mm -hmm. I, so, I really like that that yeah that's um yeah we talked already a little bit about um how much you could learn from from writing a book and how much it's different mm. you kind of mentioned already the, the the book but let's also bring it on screen here um, you were talking ah, about <laughs> um, anti patterns guide, I think. Yeah, that's the, yeah, exactly. that's yeah, the yeah. book that I um, and you talked about the anti patterns, but it's it's um, yeah, I, I've um, it reminded me about one of the um, when I was discovering agile extreme programming, there was a similar kind of books. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact title anymore, but it was also about some kind of anti-patterns about extreme programming uh, I, I still see the book in front of me it had a black cover but it was about yeah where things might not work and mm -hmm. the, the negative parts about it and i really I, I think it's one of the books that made me learn even more about it and appreciate extreme programming and agile so much because it was like okay but this is yeah this is why sometimes people misunderstand it and this is why why sometimes um yeah um yeah that that and just having someone who's and it i i don't even remember if that person was actually completely against it or it was just like okay this is another way of looking at and that's a little mm -hmm. bit how i see your book because it's it's clear you're you're still a scrum trainer so it's not like i'm anti-scrum no mm -hmm. but no, when you do that, that is, yeah, that uh, there is, there is more to to that, um, and that, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it makes people think, I would say, or at least for me, it makes me think at a, at a different kind of level, mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I really in, enjoy that in that sense. This principle of inversion, I believe, is 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 magic when it comes to learning. You know, changing the perspective. And uh, I mean, it's, it's not it's nothing new. Uh, it's a uh, um, uh, critical uh, part of Charlie Manga's Tao. You know, you, you become a good investor by simply avoiding all the stupid things. Um, it uh, we find it in practices like a pre mortem. You know, you try to think about what makes your project fail twelve months down the road, and uh, hey. Um, Unfortunately, since we're not there yet, uh, we don't have to blame anyone for doing anything, but uh, we can just point to the things that are critical for the success of our project. Um, we have a limiting structure called TRIZ, uh, where we deliberately think about, okay, how can I uh, make something fail? Huh? So uh, one of the my favorite exercises in, in, in many of my classes is, uh, um, sabotage the scrum master. You know, you're a, you're a classic uh, middle manager in the IT organization and um, you believe that uh, this scrum thingy is a fad and will go away anyway and uh, all you have to do is push it a bit. You know, and uh, how, how can you go about it? Um, please consider uh, what's, what's not okay is to outsource the jobs to the local chapter of the Health Angels, right? Um, you can only apply uh, culturally accepted means within your organization. 
and now uh, uh, unleash your inner Darth Vader and come up with some suggestions how to make the life of your Scrum Master as miserable as possible. And you I, wouldn't believe I, I how great it is. It's uh, yeah, I've, and I had I, I use a similar kind of technique sometimes in retrospectives when people are mm -hmm. really stuck. It's like there's nothing we can do to improve it. Okay, now I give you the the uh, the challenge to make things worse. What can you do to make your your whole mm -hmm. sprint, whatever you're doing as a team, to make it worse? Mm -hmm. And people that say we have no influence at all in 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 less than two three minutes, they come up mm -hmm. with so many inventive ways mm -hmm. on how they can make things worse and mm -hmm. and. It clicks, then they realize, oh, I do have influence to make things worse. So maybe mm -hmm. I can change some things out to make things better. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very powerful, I think. Um, or at least I really like that. Some people are offended by this, but yeah, okay. Uh, they, they don't, they don't like, I think it's more because they don't like to, to hear that they actually have much more power than they have. And it's uh, sometimes that is also feeling. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's showing a mirror that people don't always like. People, some people like to be in the how would I say it, uh, a victim like, oh, I can't change anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, victim mode is popular, you know, because uh, you're uh, you're pitied by others, and uh, you know, and uh, it's it's comfortable, right? Um, and by all means, you don't have to do anything because you're the victim. Uh, but um, uh, Taking refuge with Spider-Man with great power come great responsibility, you know, and you can change significantly more than a lot of people believe. Um, of course, there are always those people who say, I don't want you to think about failure. I want you to succeed. You know, thinking about failure is destructive. You don't do this. Um, I personally never understood why this is a is an issue, but <laughs> um, it's, it's not that everyone is fully embracing this, you know. And again, there are many, many different reasons why people are objecting to this approach of inversion. Mm. Yeah, I, I really like like what you say about uh, yeah that that um, how do you, um, trying to, to come up with yeah so the the fact that for some people the the failing part it's like um, there is. I don't consider failing a negative word. Some people think it's negative and we shouldn't talk about it. And it's like, no, the easiest way to avoid failure is to do nothing. But that's a failure on its own for mm. me. So you don't achieve anything. But at least nobody is reprimanding you for it. Well, I'm not mm. sure uh, if if you would be if if you would be my employee and you would not do anything. Uh, yeah, I would still fire you in in a way that yeah, because you're not achieving something, you might hide it for some time, but will always come out at, at some point, I think. One of my favorite uh, advertising spots is uh, a Nike spot with Michael Jordan. Uh, it's, it's about failure. You know, about so how they... many times he, he <laughs> said, this is why I put so many balls in it. Because yeah, I yeah, exactly. Yeah. I yeah, I really yeah. like that one. It's uh, yeah. amazing. And I still get goosebumps when I see it, you know. I failed in my life over and over and over again, and that's why I succeed. And yeah, and it's <clears throat> it's interesting because if you look at from the, just purely from the statistics, he failed much more than than the average basketball player, but he still did so much more. Uh, so it's uh, but if you it's it's interesting because if you would look just at one part of the statistics, it, you might have a completely wrong idea about how how good he is because he failed so many times yeah but and percentage wise it might still not be succeeding a lot mm -hmm. so because he's tried so much it, it's much more so it's uh, i mean it's not that failure automatically leads to success right um so you need to be able to um, understand why you failed and then do something about it and uh, yeah and i think that's, that's the hard part when people say we shouldn't talk about failing it's like yeah it's yeah, no, no. It's not just talking. It's you have mm. to actually think about it, work on it, and and see what you. Mm. What you That's a, a very nice, um, important part message that you bring. Okay, let's move to that uh, next question uh, about: Do you have any personal agility tip to share? Is there anything that you say? Okay, this is what I would like to share with people. Who are yeah, avoid uh, avoid hacks and shortcuts. Mm. 
so this this is not this is co completely unhelpful <laughs> it always it'll it'll always haunt you sooner or later there, there is no shortcut an example about about yeah why um a, a typical kind of shortcut that sometimes people try to take that actually is is bad mm -hmm. in, in the long run could you give some example on that um i spent a lot of time working with startups and here often here in berlin and we always had this discussion about uh, the quality of our tech stack and uh, it was really really hard to create an understanding among the the, the management and the founders that investing in the quality con constantly investing in the quality of the tech stack is is the most important means to to stay alive in the long run and they always said okay but you know we don't want to die in beauty if we don't make that milestone by the end of uh, november we're, we're, we're done here we're toast um so could you please uh, skip your fancy ideas of the high quality tech stack uh, technical debt we're not interested in that once we are successful we will redo everything here you know you have free reign refactoring everything of course it never happened <laughs> um, mm. So that, that is a classic example in my eyes, um, where shortcuts and hacks uh, are really, really um, detrimental to the outcome in the long run. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, this you should of course survive also in the short run, but it's yeah. that balance is is um, is really hard, and people always think like, yeah, but when one we have much more time you never especially in a startup there's like yeah. there's always something around the corner and every uh hack you take you regret in in many cases i think you regret already next week and people underestimate how much hacks are costing us in, in the long run yeah. and um of course we shouldn't prepare that the opposite i sometimes also see people preparing for yeah but when we have two million clients mm, that's a big yeah. deal. At that level, <laughs> we're not talking about that. Let's if you don't have any customers, let first have mm -hmm. a version of your customers. But whatever you do, do it with the quality at the level that mm -hmm. you are. You don't need the, the performance for two million, you can deal with oh. that later when you're closer to that after you have your first 20 or 200 customers. But that doesn't mean that it should be hacky in, in all kinds of ways. Um, that's 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 definitely something to think about so thanks for bringing that because it's it's indeed so uh so much you know ignored by many people and especially in startup or scale-up world that's like yeah, yeah, yeah let's let's quick and dirty do something well i think you underestimate how uh, how much time you lose with uh with being dirty that's usually not quick um it, it might look quick for today but not in the long run yeah, yeah. I fully agree there. Thanks. That's a that's a wonderful tip. I want to move to that next one. Um, we're we're in 2024. I, I should say I was almost about to say 23, 2024. So we're after well after COVID is still around, but still most of the world has in 2020 we moved all remotely, and that has kind of shifted a little bit back. But still, I'm interested. What did you learn about remote work? Is there something that that you think is is interesting for people to learn that uh, many people don't do, or that you think is is something crucial in how you want to work? Well, judging from my educational business, um, what I found interesting is that there are certain areas. So, for example, uh, introductory classes, beginner classes, where doing these online is actually more more effective. And uh, I would prefer them over an in-person uh, class, for example, because you can stretch them over a longer period of time. You can uh, give the people a homework to do and uh, links to read, you know, so they can um, revisit the content you were talking about and they go through the exercises. Maybe they have even the, the opportunity to practice something they learned in the class with their colleagues. You know, this is really, really helpful by all means. And uh, then on the other side, um, there are the moments when uh, remote is, is is falling a bit short. You know, so when you say, hmm. so for more advanced topics, I would always say, yeah, it would be cool if we could do this in person. <laughs> um, but then on the other side, um, going virtual has another advantage because 
now you have a significantly different um, different uh, composition of people attending classes. So I found this very interesting. So I had classes with people from Japan, South Africa, Australia, the US, Brazil. You know, it, it was was really amazing. You know, um, that would would have never happened before. You know, so on the one side, so, you, um, have to, you have to move to Japan or move to South Africa, whatever, to do one one little yes. in classes yes. each of them, but never a mix of all these cultures. That's no. what I'm hearing. No. And that is the interesting part, you know, so many ideas and thoughts and cultures coming together. And that is really, really helpful. How do other people think about this topic, for example, that you're currently trying to understand? You know, so that's, it's really, really a, a positive aspect. So heterogeneity is, is a good thing. You know, the more homogenous your composition of, of participants is, this, I wouldn't say... Um, the less interesting it becomes, <laughs> but there, there's something to it, right? Um, <clears throat> so I, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I, I can imagine that that brings in a whole different kind of um, dynamics and, and, and these kind of things. Um, how does it impact the, um, the number of courses that you give because in person you always you said you can schedule it and not have a full day so you can schedule it over multiple yes. days are you uh, are you always having the same kind of people for the multiple so if you have a, a first day and a second day and a third day i don't know how much uh, of course the session it's it always the same class or how do you how do you do oh. that no, it, it really varies. Um, so what I really like is half-day classes because um, um, if you do this in the morning hours, people are not exhausted. Um, they're not freaking out because in the afternoon they can do part of their daily jobs, you know, so that they're not uh, torn out of the organization. Um, this is really helpful. And in my experience, if you run half-day classes, for example, um, you also are more productive. You get more more stuff covered. Simply, there's more time for having discussions, and um, it's 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 really beneficial because if you run full day classes, no matter in person or or uh, remotely or virtually, um, in the afternoon people people are gone. You know, so after lunch, uh, you know, they 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 slip into food coma, <laughs> and then they wake up again uh, on day day two. They basically uh, think about okay, how how do I get out of here? You know, do I have my 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 suitcases? <laughs> Is that a raw PP if you do this in person? And so a lot of a lot of what you would actually like to to accomplish as a class um, becomes uh, I don't know less important. Let me put it this way: it does not happen if you if you do this in a remote class, you know, so no, no, no one is pinging you. Yeah, well, I need to go to the airport or something like that. It rarely happens. So uh, I really consider that an advantage. And you talked about having people from different kind of cultures mm -hmm. like Japan, South Africa, mm -hmm. but there's also time zone differences. Do you, does that mean that you, um, some people have then their afternoon or you special? Yeah, yeah. You organize classes in the afternoon for people that is yeah, there. Depends. Yes. So um, what I do for for a US client, for example, I run classes in the afternoon. So it's from from four p.m. to eight p.m. CT our time zone, and it's at the morning time zone on the East Coast in the States, and this works very well for everyone included. Mm -hmm. um, I had people. I mean, you, you get people who sign up from Washington State <laughs> in the U.S. for a class that is running uh, nine o'clock in the morning in Central European time zone. And you are, reach out to them and ask, "Are you are you sure you want to participate?" Because you were nine hours ahead of you. And then, yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. You know, I'm I'm, I'm aware of that. And uh, she got up at midnight uh, just to run the class. You know, so I found this totally amazing. <laughs> you know. Um, Apparently, it's not that much of a problem if people really want to do this and are looking forward to this. Uh, as always, motivation is a big, big moving thing. Mm -hmm. And and again, you're talking about the value for your customers in in the sense that yeah, okay, um, 
like you said earlier on, if you could do it in the morning for people itself, uh, depending on where they are, and if people are really interested, if they invest in in a different way, mm -hmm. that might uh, might indeed bring a lot of uh, work. Uh, that brings a lot of work, a lot of value and valuable discussions. That's what I was trying. To Thanks for, for sharing that. That's um, and I, you're not the first that says indeed that um, in person might bring some kind of value, but remote brings so much other different kind of values. Mm -hmm. I think also Lisa Atkins said at some point like it's not like I'm not going to go anywhere anymore. I will still do that, but mm -hmm. it, it, there still has to be value. And for some things, it just doesn't bring any value, especially for mm -hmm. for keynoting or others. For some conferences, or for some in 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 company, one hour training in that all of us do from time to time. We're not going to hop on a plane and and mm. and spend a full day and whatever just to deliver one hour training or one hour mm. presentation. I much rather do two hours and then or an hour before preparation, an hour doing it, and an hour after talk for that same thing and avoiding me that I can have to go mm -hmm. and, and, and leave my family for everything with, with that. So that, uh, that brings in a lot of other things. That, um, that, that, that's, that's, that's definitely a point. For example, I have currently an invitation for a, for a, a keynote at a conference and uh, it would take me approximately three days to get there and get back just to deliver the keynote because due to flight schedules, et cetera, PP. Uh, unless I want to take an eight-hour detour flight <laughs> uh, across half of Europe or something like that. And uh, seriously, uh, I asked myself, okay, why would I invest three days of my life to deliver a one, one-hour keynote? Um, talking about things that uh, I probably have addressed uh, a thousand times before. And um, why, why would I willingly spend so much time in, in, in airports and on public transport and whatnot uh, for this whole thing. And so, uh, yeah, not easy, no? Mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I can definitely hear that. Uh, there, like everything, it has its pro and cons and sometimes easier and hard parts. Let's move to that uh, next question. Um, what is a book that you have read or a book that you want to um, make some publicity for? Publicity? Um, okay. Uh, two yeah, things. No, something you want to talk about, yeah, indeed. So, first of all, um, the, 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 the larger book I read before is uh, a history book, you know, so it's uh, for those, uh, Adrian Goldsworthy, uh, The Eagle and the Lion, Rome, Persia, and the Unwinnable Conflict. So, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's about uh, covering um, almost a millennia of uh, well, 800 years of uh, Roman Persian history. I found this really really interesting. Um, so, but that is the more fun part. Um, <clears throat> what I'm really interested in, as far as uh, our profession is concerned, uh, um, I read. Could you, could you say some more? Because you 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 talk you go. It, I think it's interesting that people also bring not just the professional part, um, mm -hmm. so. Is there is there a particular reason why you bring up that book, the, the Eagle and, and the Lion? What I found interesting about the book is that you have this perception of okay inevitability. You know, there are two empires side by side, and uh, somehow they need to clash or something like that. And then you figure out okay, actually, if you if you if, if you cover a, a broader spectrum uh, time-wise um, a, a few centuries you figure out okay they actually have more interests in common they are more aligned <laughs> than they are all opposing so yeah. at the end of the book i thought to myself okay maybe um, maybe they actually the, the the moments of conflict were the exception uh, and not the the uh, uh, not the, the the standard procedure that they consider themselves. So the and that was something not... that I, at least I didn't learn in school. And so that book brought you that kind of uh, mm -hmm. I don't know um, reality check. I would say yes. in a always. Way. Yeah. So again, it's a, a bit like uh, okay, let's have a few different perspectives on these things and how we can interpret them and what is different and. Uh, um, how do they align with uh, what we've always been believing? And then you figure out, okay, maybe it's 
been just convenient the way we looked at it before, you know, for whatever reason. You know, brings us back to Kahneman 1 and Kahneman 2. You know? So I'd like to, to read a few books that trigger Kahneman 2. Um, if I manage to go through the book, I mean, there were 600 pages <laughs> and I skipped the footnotes. Um, and probably I will read it again in a few years. Um, but uh, th that was a fun exercise. No, so that was the private one. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, it. I, I yeah, I I want to take some, or I wanted to take some extra time because typically, indeed, we talk just about the business or the professional kind of books. Uh, but most of us don't just read these kind of books. Uh, I, I have to say, most of the books I'm reading is much more indeed on the professional side. But sometimes there are also a little bit escapades or whatever, and then it's always interesting to learn more. So you wanted to talk about another one that was more in our... Yeah, um, so the book I really appreciated most uh, during the last six months is uh, Martin Dahlman's book on, on sprint goals, because I believe you did an Yes, exactly. He did an excellent job about the, the, the whole topic, you know, and he has a very... Uh, very funny and entertaining way to actually do this. Um, so uh, I highly appreciate the effort. And um, I think it has a lot of potential to help people think about, okay, what what, what is it about goals and planning and um, how, how may it work out and what do you have to watch out for? And um, so that, that was really, really interesting from my perspective. I, I highly appreciated this. And of course, if you if you're quoting Mike Tyson, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, that is uh, already funny, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, yeah, and I think it's it's a book. I, I have to admit, I haven't read it myself, but it's a book that um, that I've heard already multiple people talk about. Not not here in the podcast. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, yeah, it, it's it's really um, it it looks like a simple concept, sprint goals, mm -hmm. and, and at at first it's like, can you write a full book about it? I don't think it's that big, if if I remember correctly, uh, because I, I have it's it's easy manageable, um, two hundred fifty something pages or so. Um, no, but um, it's. I find it interesting how he's uh, developing the topic and um, that you can spend so much more time on this and put so much more effort into this because, um, okay, now that we call it sprint goals in a certain context, but this idea of planning and we have goals that we like to achieve, we have agendas, uh, uh, we want to be somewhere in, in the future um, that has accompanied our species for for millennia, you know, so this is uh, it's always been the same. Um, so the the idea, hey, we are not uh, reaching our sprint goals. What might be the reason for that is not new. You know, so um, I'm probably butchering Eisenhower, but you know this this idea of um, um, plans are worthless, planning is indispensable, um, really comes into the forefront. And I think that this is one of the really critical aspects of making agile work for you, that you get a better understanding about the whole topic. Now, which uh, also brings us back to the um, thought that we had at the beginning, you know, that humans, uh, humans don't feel comfortable in complex situations, that they don't like certainty, uh, uncertainty. Um, on the contrary, they, they want to, to have a goal and that they can work for that goal and then they feel good because they're active and uh, they forge their own fate and uh, they're not uh, become a, a play plaything of the um, dark powers surrounding them <laughs> you know so and a lot of that I believe is simply made up you know we're, we're, we're talking to ourselves we make ourselves believe that, that we're on the right track so, oh yeah, I think, and well, and and history is made by the survivors. So uh, there is a survival, oh, yeah. bias, of course, the winner bias that we say this is because we did it that way. But maybe there's thousands of companies or teams that worked in the exact way that didn't survive, and we were just lucky, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but but yeah, 
to come back to the topic the, the uh, of of the sprint goals it's just having that focus having people it's it's amazing that um how much impact that can have and people you you talked before about indeed having a purpose um if we just look at at items or stories or whatever at at single kind of things and not in the board, larger picture uh, it usually becomes very well boring is maybe the wrong word but mundane work but if you have a real goal let's let's go for that it's a little bit i see it a little bit as people that would do i don't know training for for a marathon or for the olympics or whatever that's the most boring thing there is every day waking up and doing i don't know 200 miles by 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 bicycle or, or running or whatever that's very boring but if you think about okay i want to be in the olympics and i want to be in paris there in in, in this summer that's a whole different ball game that's the goal totally. and of course in 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 a team we're thinking about a goal for the next two weeks uh, and and sprint goal but still it's it's a goal that that yeah inspires um and um and i yeah I, it, this is why uh like i said i haven't read the book yet but why i'm interested to learn how we can do it um and that is um i what i like so much about scrum in a sense it's like the sprint the scrum guide is like 13 pages it's this very small little thing mm -hmm each and well every concept that is there you can probably have a full book about it of mm -hmm. two three pages and that people really think uh, again looking for kahneman for that deeper thought let's not just think a uh, small thing but yeah okay what does that actually mean uh, i really like that kind of thing so thanks for for bringing that up it's uh, i think it's uh, well it's kind of hard for me to say about a book that i haven't read but i do value uh, people that will make us think uh, harder as well. So thank you for bringing uh, this book up here. So let's move to that uh, next question. What question do you think I should also ask you and what's the answer? And I'm really, after, like I said, reading a lot of your stuff, what you're writing online, I'm really interested in what is the kind of question you think I should also ask? Oh my goodness. <sighs> that is a difficult one. <laughs> um maybe what i would if i could turn back time what i would uh choose to become a trainer again not necessarily a scrum trainer but a trainer in general educating people you know so um did you, for example, if I let, before you go answer that question, if you look back at your life when you were yourself in school, did you ever see yourself as teaching? Oh, I did this all my life, uh, but I did it on the side for my for my classmates, for example. So wow, that was never an issue. Um, so I I I I, had, I helped people in the past, and um, so I enjoyed it. You know, um, that was fun. It, it felt good. You, you accomplished something, and so I, that, was, that was fun all the time. Um, so that's uh, certainly that's in general not the issue. Um, what might be more kind of issue is um, should we do training the way we do training? You know, what about the um, the agile industrial complex, you know, the certification machine. <laughs> um, okay, I'm uh, luckily I'm I'm, uh, I'm affiliated with an organization that is not putting these certificates at the at the, at the front and center of what they're doing. Um, but nevertheless, you you often get mixed up with the other people who do this. I mean, just look at the safe people. You know, this 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 is. Uh, Reminds me of the bad old times, you know, when you had to update your uh, SAP R3 certificates uh, every single year. And you said, oh, my God, uh, now I have to go through these stupid questions again and learn for the for this multiple choice test or so that I get a new piece of paper. You know? um, <clears throat> so that, that certainly is a is a is a is an interesting topic. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people are unfair about this. You know, so 
I do believe that certificates are valuable in a sense, if they're not given away for free, right? Um, if you have to work for them, if you have to show that you, if you can demonstrate that you that you learn something, okay, that 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 is a must from my perspective. But um, it helps people to get jobs because um, uh, the people folks are searching for this. I mean. Um, you want to be a CSM or PSM as a Scrum Master because that's one of the search terms on LinkedIn. If, if you want to get some jobs, um, you better um, consider uh, acquiring one of these certificates, right? Very simple. Um, on the other side, what I always, what I always enjoy is this, um, when people in my classes prepare for their certifications and you, you, know, you notice that the, the work they're putting in and uh, the way they're preparing themselves, and we typically have a have uh, an extra meeting for just the purpose of okay, um, how, how how can how can you go through the certification? You know what are what are good good tips and tricks? You know how to prepare yourself, uh, what not to do. So very pragmatic, and uh, how engaged people are. So it, it is meaningful to them. You know, yeah, it's. For me, it, it reminds me, uh, I had once a teacher, a um, history teacher, who said, um, don't worry for the exam. I will give you all the, the questions that you have to learn, that you will, I will ask at the, at the exam, which was at first like, okay. But then we received like 500 questions. And he says, out of these, I will ask 10 or 5 or I don't remember anymore. So I had to learn. And basically... It was another way for me. I tried to, and I say 500 because I don't know the exact number, but it was lots and lots of questions. And I tried to answer each of them and prepared it. And I realized by doing that, I was mm -hmm. actually learning much more about the whole, everything that we needed to do. And I learned so much preparing this. And, and in the end, it was another way of studying what I had to study. Uh, and, and in that sense, I do agree that sometimes thinking about it in, in a different way. And yeah, for me, the value is in the learning process, in the mm -hmm. learning of answering this and, and, and doing something. Um, and that, yeah, that, that is the totally. whole lot of the value. Um, on the other hand, I do think um, I had once a conversation, I think I've said it already here on the show as well, with my very first boss. Um, I talked about, this was not Agile certification, it was by Microsoft. Uh, .NET certifications or something like that. I was uh, a .NET trainer at that time. And, and I was not in favor of certifications, but he said, if you have to... And so I left that company, I think, 10 years ago or something, 10 years before. And he told me, like, when you joined the company, I put out an ad and I got, like, five to 10 CVs for, for that job that you took in the end so that, we, that we hired you for. If I now put out the same job, 15, 20 years later, I get three, 400 CVs because it's on the internet and many people are looking for jobs. It's just impossible for me to read all of them because I don't have time for that. So I have an mm. assistant and I thank you. I actually think it was his son that would, he just gave him a list of things. Look for these kind of words, these kind of certificates. If that's there, that you put that CV on, on, um, on, on a, on, on um, I don't know, on uh, on a place where I will read them. And he said to me, if I know I will miss out some good mm -hmm. people, but it's just impossible for me to go to the full list. So this mm -hmm. is a way to filter out stuff. I know I will miss the good some good people and probably the best I will miss, but it's mm -hmm. just impossible for me to take mm -hmm. the time to review all of these. And that was the first time that I thought about it from a scaling point of view, like, mm -hmm. okay, and, and this is just a small company with, with less than, than 15 people. If you have a large company, you probably get even more. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that makes it a lot harder. So there is at some point a kind of thing um, that, yeah, we, that can bring value. Of course, I do hope, and in his case, I do know, that was just the first step. After that, you still have the interview that people have to mm -hmm. convince you. It's not because you have all these different kind of stamps for organizations that you actually know your shit. That's a different kind of thing. But a really interesting thing to, to think about um, and, and the concept of, okay, it's interesting that you bring up that question because 
with the sub question I asked, you immediately said, I've been a trainer all my life. I've maybe not a, a, a official training, but I have been helping people and educating people, even at school and helping people. And still then wonder, is training really what I want to do? But I so much like the, the sub things around it it's, it's certification it, it's much more than just educating people it's a, a lot more uh, and like you say um sometimes people look these days very bad on 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 certain kind of training ah because you do that kind of certification then you will be as bad as some of the other people well that's no then you're doing the opposite mistake or the same mistake that many others are doing mm. So thanks for bringing that that part, and it's a really interesting question to think about. Okay, I want to move to um, that question about who else should I invite? Who do you think I should ask next to to talk? And I think I know you have a very large network. So I, 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 yeah. I think you come up with lots and lots of names, and you might give us a few. But what's uh, the first person, or what's one of these people that come to your mind? Right? No, um, um, I would be consistent here. I would really uh, point to Martin Diamond because um, he's a wonderful guy. Um, I met him early, uh, last year here in Berlin when he was talking at a conference. And uh, I think he, he is, um, right. yeah, he is uh, one of the leading voices that we have in the, in the industry. And um, so uh, I really highly enjoy uh, conversing with him. And uh, I believe he may be a good candidate for for another interview here. Thank you very much. I'm bring you back on screen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is like I uh, he's he was already just like you were already for a long time on my list. And typically, it's about uh, having other people kind of invite. I sometimes invite people myself, but uh, I really like that um, when people are inviting others uh yeah it, it usually brings in another kind of dynamic when people say oh i've actually met this person and or i've worked with this person and this is the one of these nice people to think about. so very much uh, really happy about uh, you introducing him and bringing to to, to me uh, not just this book but also um yeah as a person to to, to talk to um we're running uh, out of our time and out of questions. Uh, for um, the people that want to contact you, what would be a good way for, for, for talking to people, having contact? I think the easiest way is LinkedIn. So uh, spend a lot of time. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. It's subdomain depending if you uh, if you do LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah you just not. search for me. There are very very few Stefan Wolbers around. <laughs> um, you 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 can't miss me. <laughs> um, so I think that would be the the easiest way to do this. And yeah. Well, um, I, like I said, um, it's been a wonderful time. It's been wonderful conversation with you. Um, it's a little, uh, so not not two hours, but it's really we went in all kind of directions, all kind mm -hmm. of things and some kind of things. Um, and I really like how you a little bit like what you say. You think deeper at at first, and some of your answers is like okay, there's a short answer, but then there is actually a lot bigger part of that uh, that makes it the conversation so much nicer and and so much interesting so really thank you for your time and um i hope to to run into you in yeah somewhere more in in, in the future um mm -hmm. actually at the end of january i will be at a conference in munich munich and um uh object oriented op um um I, I can't come up with the exact name but a programmer conference in munich uh, at the end of uh, OP 2024 OP conference. That's the, the name of uh, in Munich. So I will be uh, in your country, but of course, there's many things going on in. So. Eve, first of all, thanks a lot for having me. I really enjoyed this interview. It's uh, it's been very different from other interviews uh, I've been asked to do <laughs> um, because we 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 touch so many different things. I really enjoy that and. Uh, um, I'm glad I found someone who um, enjoys uh, 
talking about Kahneman one and two, <laughs> uh, like I do, you know, so makes life easier yeah. in my perspective. It, uh, yeah, I, I do it. I, I love it very much. Uh, I do have had multiple conversations around it already, but indeed sometimes people uh, it, like it because it's a hard book. People yeah need to take the time to understand it and to think more, uh, and and that is that is important to, to to have it. And a little bit like what you say, sometimes on on the internet people are going very quickly with with a kind of opinion and don't always take the time to read uh, books like Kahneman, uh, thinking uh, fast and slow. It's um, it's one of these um, gimmicks that is non-agile book and at the same the most agile book that there exists there yes i fully agree so that's uh that's anyway i yeah i enjoyed it as much and let's uh let's hope we meet each other in person again somewhere else absolutely absolutely bye bye thank you for watching who's agile where the stories of agilists come to life i hope you like today's interview subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists